What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about COPD. This is a part of our clinical medicine section, and if you guys like it, please support us, and you can do that by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and also subscribing. I also suggest if you guys have the opportunity to go down the description box below, there's a link to our website where we have amazing notes, illustrations, we're developing exam prep courses for those of you taking your step one, your step two, your pants, etc. And we have some great merchandise that I suggest you guys check out. All right, let's start talking about COPD. With COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, there is two types, but oftentimes most patients kind of present with a mixture of the two. We're gonna start with the first one, that being chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis, the primary way that these patients present, when they come into the clinic or they come into the hospital, they'll usually present with a productive cough. That's by far, I would say, one of the most common presentations. They may also present with some signs of dyspnea. So we could also you know, suggest that that would be another particular finding. The other thing is the physical exam findings. So whenever you have them come in, they have a productive cough, maybe they have some dyspnea, you go to the bedside, you examine them. What are some of the things that you'll actually appreciate on their exam? One of those things is that sometimes when you get your stethoscope out, you listen, you hear a lot of wheezing and ronchi. That's very classic of patients who have chronic bronchitis. So listen for any type of wheezing, usually due to an airway obstruction from mucus, and also listen for ronchi, which is again, mucus within the airways, but clears when you have the patient kind of cough. So it sounds like a snoring type of sound on auscultation. You have them cough, clears a little bit, sounds a little bit better. That's usually suggestive of these particular two. Now, the thing that I want you guys to think about with chronic bronchitis is why do they present with a productive cough? Why do they present with wheezing and ronchi? Well, the process here is super, super interesting. One of the things that we see with these patients is they have a lot of inflammation within their airways, and that is the key thing, and there may also be some irreversible fibrosis from chronic inflammation. We'll talk about the means by which chronic inflammation develops. Well, when we take a section out of these guys' bronchioles and we zoom in on it, what does it look like? One of the big things is that there is a massive amount of mucus within the airways. So tons and tons of mucus within their airways. And therefore, if you think about that, if they have lots and lots of mucus within the airways, guess why they're having a productive cough, a cough that's containing a lot of this mucus kind of material. That is the reason why. So heavy, heavy mucus within the airways. What would that do? Well, it narrow the airway lumen. And so that would make it really difficult to get air in and get air out, more particularly getting air out, right? And if your lungs get super hyperinflated, my diaphragm's pushed out, I can't take a deep breath in. That's usually one of the reasons why these patients also present with dyspnea. The other cool thing about this patient population is that they also have, because of the inflammation, lots of mucus production from their goblet cells, but they undergo a lot of fibrosis. This activates a lot of fibroblasts and they lay down a lot of this collagen, fibrous tissue, which unfortunately narrows the airway as well. So having this fibrosis, makes this two things. One, it makes this disease irreversible, but it also narrows the airways. And by default, that will make it difficult to be able to, again, get air in and get air, get air out. And again, I would stress that it's more difficult in getting air out than it is getting air in. Again, mucus production excessively from inflammation by goblet cells, platelets laying down a lot of fibrous tissue, which makes this irreversible destructive lesions. That's why it's chronic and these patients usually don't have the ability to come back to their normal bronchial airway function. Usually there's progressive fibrosis that makes this an irreversible disease. The last one's a really big one from inflammation. This is bronchospasm. These patients also develop a ton of bronchospasm. And again, inflammation activates leukotrienes, it activates histamine molecules, and this bronchospasm also really narrows the airway. So combine bronchospasm, combine mucus and fibrosis, you have a super obstructed airway. And again, common theme here, difficult getting air in and out, but I would stress more on the difficulty of getting air out. Now with all of these combinations of things, we say that COPD is a part of what's called an obstructive lung disease in combination with asthma. You notice a similar theme against these. With asthma, there was no fibrosis though, right? With COPD, you'll notice fibrosis and mucus and bronchospasm. More bronchial wall edema and asthma, less of that present within the COPD patients. But what you'll see here is with the combination of these three things, the airway is super obstructed. And that airway obstruction is really the hallmark of why these patients look the way they look. Let me explain that in another way. If I have an increased airway obstruction that I form within this alveoli, so here's a little bronchial, 
Here's going to be some smaller bronchioles and then an alveoli. Here's normal. All of a sudden, I decide to have some mucus, some fibrosis of this bronchial. I bronchospasm this area. What's it going to do now? It's going to make it really difficult to get CO2 out of the lungs. That's going to be impossible. So now I can't get CO2 out. As I can't get CO2 or air out of the lungs, the CO2 will build up. But in general, the, the lungs will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So what we notice here is we notice that these patients develop a lot of air trapping. And as they air trap because of this airway obstruction, what do we notice? The alveoli will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, the patient's lungs will become hyperinflated. So that's another potential finding that we can see with these patients is they have hyperinflation of their lungs. Now you're like, okay, isn't that a good thing? Don't we want them lungs to be big? No, because if they're too big, imagine taking a deep breath in. Hold it. Now try to take a deep breath on top of that. How difficult would that be? That's why it's so difficult for these patients to take a breath in because their lungs are already filled as much as they possibly can because of airway obstruction. So we're taking a patient with normal lungs causing dynamic hyperinflation via air trapping and then from that increased hyperinflation making it difficult to take a breath in. This is usually the pathophysiology that progresses in patients with chronic bronchitis, the type of COPD. The question comes, what in the heck is causing all of this process? I already told you. It was something that's really, really, really jacking up a lot of inflammation. And this inflammation is not a one-time experience like you have an asthma that it comes around every now and then. This is something where these cells your lymphocytes, your macrophages, your neutrophils, these are releasing tons and tons of cytokines. Massive amounts of cytokines and growth factors and things to that effect. And these guys are really amplifying your inflammatory response. And as they do that, they stimulate these things that we see here. Goblet cells to make a lot of mucus, platelets to make a lot of fibrous tissue, and smooth muscle starts really becoming hyper-responsive and spastic and starts narrowing the airways. We obstruct and we precipitate the findings that we see here, which is the patient air trapping and dynamic hyperinflation. Question is, what the heck is causing these, these immune system cells to become hyperactive? Well, the primary cause here is smoking. Smoking is by far going to be the biggest trigger for this immune system activation, particularly neutrophils, CD8 lymphocytes and macrophages. That's it. So now we have an understanding of chronic bronchitis. Let's come down now and talk about the next part of this COPD picture, which is the patient who exhibits findings of emphysema. So emphysema, again, is a little bit different and it only differs a teensy bit within the pathophysiology. But again, the concept exists as the same. COPD can be a mixture of these two patient populations. It's just on exam, and when learning it, you want to be able to have some differentiations of it. Let's talk about emphysema. Emphysema, these patients will not really present with a productive cough. Usually what makes chronic bronchitis very specific is that productive cough for a long time. I'm talking like three plus months for like two consecutive years. Emphysema is way more likely to cause things like dyspnea and particularly dyspnea on exertion. But dyspnea in general is gonna be by far, I'd say one of the most common features. So if you have a patient come in with dyspnea and a cough, again, it could be a mixture of the two. But if you hear dyspnea, think a little bit more for your exams about emphysema. The other thing is that these patients' lungs are super huge, and we'll talk about why. They're much, much more hyperinflated than the chronic bronchitis picture. So because of that, these patients usually have this like, big, big chest, like I'm talking like a barrel chest. So sometimes you'll see what's called a increased AP diameter, which means that they just have these huge lungs. They, ha they have what we call this barrel chest. And because their lungs are so huge and hyper aerated and hyper inflated, the breath sounds sound very diminished. And the reason why is because their lungs are so huge, it's really hard for them to take air in. And that's why I feel like I'm short of breath all the time, right? So this, sometimes you'll see this concept of the breath sounds being like somewhat reduced or diminished. So if I see 
This increased AP diameter, a barrel chest type of presentation, and decreased breath sounds in combination with a dyspneic patient. I definitely am starting to think a little bit more about emphysema than the chronic bronchitis patient. Either way, what's the pathophysiological difference? In this one, it was inflammation and fibrosis. In this one, it's tissue, structure, tissue destruction secondary to inflammation and fibrosis. Let me explain. Here's a zoomed in portion of the airway. You don't notice any mucus. That's one of the big highlighting features of chronic bronchitis. And here, here's the airway, and on the outside of them is this elastic tissue. What happens in this disease is they have a decrease in the elastic tissue. Now, if you decrease elastic tissue within the bronchioles, this will cause the bronchioles to not be able to keep to stay open essentially. So with decreasing elastic tissue, the bronchioles will begin to collapse a, bit, a little bit. So that's one downstream effect out of this, is that with decreasing elastic tissue, one of the things that you'll see as a result of this is bronchial collapse. The other thing that's really interesting is that in these patients, they also have destruction, not just of the elastic tissue. So look, this thing's getting chewed up here. I'm gonna kind of like chew it up a little bit. Chewing up the elastic tissue, and now these bronchioles can't stay open and they start collapsing. The other thing is that they start having destruction of some of the elastic tissue and the septa that are present between alveoli. So now I'm gonna chew up some of this elastic tissue here and then I'm gonna start breaking down the septa between alveoli. And then what happens is, is you end up with these gargantuous like alveoli, these big, big sacs of alveoli. So the other one is you're gonna get alveolar septa, septal destruction. And the combination of that leads to these like massively large airways. So you have increased alveolar septal destruction decreases in elastic tissue. And what's the other last thing that you can see here? Fibrosis, all right? Making this an irreversible type of disease. So we have a combination of fibrosis, alveolar septal destruction, and decreased elastic tissue because I'm destroying that. What fibrosis does is it leads to bronchial collapse. So now I have bronchial collapse here as well because I'm not able to kind of like keep this airway kind of open, it's now narrowed. And this scenario here, that's again, a problem of getting air in and out. But if I have the combination of bronchial collapse from fibrosis and decreased elastic tissue within the bronchioles, that's one thing. And the second thing is I'm gonna have these gargantuous airways. So with the bronchial collapse, this is where you'll get airway obstruction, okay? That's where the airway obstruction comes into play. All right, so we're gonna get airway obstruction from the bronchial collapse, from elastic tissue that's being destroyed within the bronchial walls, and from, from fibrosis. What happens with the alveolar septal destruction is a little bit different, and this is what makes emphysema a tiny bit different. Here we have a normal lung tissue, right, with some normal elastic tissue. As I start causing alveolar septal destruction, destruction of elastic tissue and fibrosis, these bronchioles start collapsing. If they collapse, now CO2 can't get out. If CO2 can't get out, air stays within these alveoli and it makes them bigger. So there is the concept of air trapping, just the same as it was with chronic bronchitis. That's why these two are very, very difficult to differentiate sometimes. But here's the big difference. I've destroyed the elastic tissue and then on top of that, I've caused alveolar septal destruction. So not only do I have air trapping, but I have very large alveoli. So now I have these massively enlarged airways. So air trapping and enlarged air sacs. So when I have these enlarged air sacs from air trapping and alveolar septal destruction, these things get huge, these lungs. And this is what leads to this classic hyperinflation. If I can't get air out, it's gonna cause these alveoli to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then that's gonna to lead to the lungs getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And these guys have these huge, like big, big lungs. And now if their lungs are super hyperinflated, they can't take a deep breath in above what they're already at, all right? That's the classic presentation that you're gonna see is enlarged air sacs causing air and air trapping, leading to increased 
hyperinflation in this patient population. Question comes here, this was chronic inflammation. Guess what? It's the same thing. It's just a teensy bit different. Neutrophils, all right, in scenarios, two scenarios. One, the primary cause here is going to be the same, smoking, but we're going to add one more to spice it up a little bit. Their disease called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So two of these can cause this. Let me explain what I mean. Neutrophils and exposure to smoking will cause, uh, neutrophils will actually release a molecule called elastases. So they release these molecules called elastases. Now what's supposed to happen is, when smoking is present, smoking will actually lead to this process where it'll actually kind of lead to increased inflammation. So it'll help to be able to stimulate, unfortunately, these neutrophils, and that'll increase the elastases. So that's one downside of this. But the other thing is that there's an enzyme. There's an enzyme here, and it's called alpha-1 antitrypsin. And what alpha-1 antitrypsin is supposed to do is, is it's supposed to degrade or inhibit these elastases. So it breaks them down. What smoking and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency do is they decrease the presence of alpha-1 antitrypsin because smoking will lead to the degradation of this enzyme and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency will lead to the deficiency of this enzyme. And now we have less of these to inhibit elastases. And so this pathway is lost and elastases build up and build up. And guess what they like to break down? Elastic tissue. And this is where they will start causing destruction of elastic tissue, propagating inflammation, which will lead to fibrosis, and they'll destroy some of the alveolar septa. All of these things lead to airway obstruction, hyperinflation, and enlarged air sacs. That's the big, big thing to remember. One of the things that can come up that they try to test you with is smoking is definitely gonna affect more of the upper lobes of the lung. Whereas a patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, this will affect more of the lower lobes of the lung. So if I were to compare here, let's say red is going to be smoking, this will affect the upper lobes. And if I were to say here in this, uh, let's use this pink color here, this was alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, this will affect more of the lower lobes of the lungs. So that's the predilection here, is red will be smoking, and then the pink here will represent the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's another thing that they like to kind of like throw onto the exam that I don't want you guys to miss. Okay, my friends. So at this point, we have covered the pathophysiology, the causes, the history, the physical exam findings that are suggestive of patients with COPD. What I really wanna do is talk about what are the complications that can arise in these patients who have COPD. All right guys, so now COPD, we have to talk about what are the potential complications. One of the big ones I'd say, especially with chronic bronchitis, is pneumonia. This can happen, generally patients who have pneumonia, you definitely wanna be thinking about uh, potential causes such as chronic bronchitis. The primary process behind this is that there's obstruction of the airways. And so if you can't clear bacteria out of the airways, they'll build up. And if they build up with inside of the actual alveoli or the bronchi, they can definitely start precipitating colonization, infection, destruction of cellular debris, white blood cell infiltration, and then you end up with a pneumonia. So again, the primary process by which pneumonia occurs is because of airway obstruction. And you obstruct the airway, not only is this preventing CO2 from getting out and oxygen from getting in, but it also decreases the clearance of bacteria because naturally what happens here is that you should have cilia that beat the actual bacteria up. You know what else is interesting? In patients who smoke, so again, we know that airway obstruction can actually decrease clearance of bacteria. But the other concept here is that smoking destroys cilia. So if you have cilia destruction or dysfunction because of smoking, which is common in patients who have chronic bronchitis or emphysema, what happens? You lead to decreased clearance of bacteria. If you can't clear them, they stay there, they colonize, and if opportunities arise, they will cause infection. Then patients will present with things like fevers, mucoperlin sputum,
hypoxemia, potential signs of respiratory distress. So that's one of the big things there. Second one is respiratory failure. Patients with chronic bronchitis are very, very common to decompensate. This could be due to an acute exacerbation of COPD, or this could just be chronic. What I want you to think about with respiratory failure is there's usually a trigger. So sometimes we refer to this as sometimes a, let's actually put this in parentheses here. This is acute exacerbation of COPD. And this can present as respiratory failure. I'd say by far one of the most common triggers is a viral upper respiratory tract infection, right? So if a patient develops, for example, a viral upper respiratory tract infection, what that's gonna do is, is that's going to increase the inflammation within the airways, right? Now, if I increase the inflammation within the airways, I'm gonna cause more bronchospasm, more mucopurulent type of production within the airways, and that's gonna cause airway obstruction. If I get an increase in airway obstruction now, what happens is it makes it even more difficult to get CO2 out of the lungs. So CO2 getting out of the lungs is gonna be very, very difficult because of the airway obstruction. So CO2 will build up in the bloodstream as a result. That's called hypercapnia, right? Now the other concept here, because CO2 can't be cleared, is that the airways actually get a little bit more air trapping and hyperinflation. So if you have hyperinflation, your lungs are super, super expanded, what happens? It's difficult to take a deep breath in, so your tidal volumes drop. And if your tidal volumes drop, then you have difficulty in being able to get air into the lungs. And so as a result, the O2 delivery to the alveoli can also reduce. And if that happens, there's a reduction in O2 delivery, this can also lead to less oxygen getting into the bloodstream. And what's that called? That's called hypoxemia. So now these patients can potentially have a low oxygen, oh, son of a gun, they can have low oxygen and elevated CO2. When this happens, when you have these patients, this is more likely to be the presentation of what we call a type two respiratory failure. So this can cause a type two, we're gonna put RF, respiratory failure, which is classified by an elevated CO2 and a low oxygen. This is super common, especially in acute exacerbations of COPD, is elevated CO2 because of airway obstruction and hypoventilation causing decreased ventilation and decreased oxygenation. What happens in these patients is a viral upper respiratory tract infection is usually the big trigger because it propagates an increase in inflammation and therefore an increase in airway obstruction. And that's where all of this kind of just runs downhill is you have some particular trigger. There is other triggers besides a viral upper respiratory tract infection. Another one because you're just not taking your medications, so you're non-compliant with your albuterol inhalers or your steroid inhalers, and that could definitely worsen the airway obstruction. So it also could be due to medication non-compliance. But I would say by far the more common etiology is the viral upper respiratory tract infection. And this is why we actually tell people who have COPD, hey, make sure that you get vaccinated against influenza or other viruses. Because again, you get an infection, you would worsen the airway obstruction, you could decompensate and cause these problems. Now, if a patient has these problems where they have elevated CO2 and low oxygen, one of the other big things that'll actually happen here is that they will work really hard. They'll work really hard to try to take a deep breath in, blow off their CO2, take in more oxygen. So what will happen is their respiratory rate will start to go up, their work of breathing will start to go up, and they will look like they're an extremis. And that could be a potential sign of an acute exacerbation of COPD, okay? This may be picked up off the blood gas, but this may be the signs that you see or the patient may complain of dyspnea. This is extremely common in chronic bronchitis. Here's one big thing I wanna add on. This drop in the O2, is extremely more common in chronic bronchitis than it is in emphysema. Patients with emphysema will generally not drop their O2 until they're in the severe, severe stages of emphysema. Chronic bronchitis, though, they will. That's a big thing to remember. Okay, pneumonia, respiratory failure due to an acute exacerbation of their COPD from these particular etiologies. What else can happen? All right, because these patients develop irreparable damage to their lungs, they develop so much fibrosis and inflammation and all of these processes, what's the recurring theme? That they can develop hypoxemia. 
all right? This hypoxemia due to this lung disease leads to what? So because of their COPD, they have hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is a potent pulmonary vasoconstrictor. So what it'll do is it'll actually cause pulmonary vasoconstriction. Look at these. Blood flow is supposed to be going on here and then just like, wah, clamp down. What does that do to the pulmonary vascular resistance? It's going to go up. So now, because these things are clamped down because of the hypoxemia, your pulmonary vascular resistance will go up. So your afterload will go up. That's another way of saying it. The resistance to blood flow will go up. What happens to the right heart pressure? It'll have to rise more. And over time, what that'll do is that'll cause the pulmonary artery pressure will become so high that the right heart has to work really, really hard. What's it called whenever the pulmonary artery pressure is really high? Pulmonary hypertension. So these patients can, over time, because of this high resistance, lead to what's called type 3 pulmonary artery hypertension. And then over time, the right heart will have to hypertrophy. It'll try its best to start thickening. And because of that, eventually, it'll fail. So these patients, over time, because of this pulmonary artery hypertension, will develop features of what's called right heart failure. How's that classified? Elevated central venous pressure, right? So they have a hard time getting blood in to the right heart and getting blood out of the right heart. So this is impaired. Difficulty getting in, difficulty getting out. So because of that, what happens to their central venous pressure? It rises. And if you develop increased central venous pressures, what does that look like? Jugular venous distension. This can cause hepatic congestion, or we call hepatomegaly. This can cause elevated pulmonary artery, uh, sorry, uh, portal venous pressures, which we call ascites whenever it causes portal hypertension. And it can also cause swelling of the lower extremities, which we call pedal edema. These are classic findings of right heart failure. And again, I want you to understand something, my friends. If you see hypoxemia as the big factor here, what did I tell you? What was the primary COPD ET like type or subtype that caused hypoxemia, chronic bronchitis. You will not see right heart failure as commonly in patients who have emphysema. Okay, so that's very, very specific there. We come to the last scenario here, polycythemia. Again, because patients develop these terribly low oxygen levels in chronic bronchitis, they drop their oxygen levels. And you know what happens whenever you drop your oxygen levels because of this underlying lung disease? You tell your kidney, hey, oxygen's low. What your kidney thinks is, is that, oh, there's maybe less number of red blood cells. So what I'll do is I'll tell the body to make more erythropoietin. And if I tell them to make more erythropoietin, that'll say, hey, bone marrow, increase the production of red blood cells. And so that's what it'll do. It'll tell, hey, hey, bone marrow, we got to get more oxygen. So we probably need more red blood cells. Go ahead and pump me out some more. And it increases the number of red blood cells. And whenever you increase the number of red blood cells within the bloodstream, this is classic of a patient who has polycythemia. So look for an elevated hemoglobin, an elevated hematocrit, and more red blood cells. And if they have an underlying history of chronic bronchitis, it could be due to that. Okay. So now that we've covered chronic bronchitis with the primary findings that we've discussed, what about the complications that can arise in emphysema? With emphysema, again, you can see pneumonia. I would say it's not as common as you can see in chronic bronchitis, but you can see it. And again, it's a two-factor process. You're having difficulty with clearing bacteria, and it's twofold. One is because of ciliary dysfunction. What's causing the ciliary dysfunction? It is smoking. Smoking destroys cilia. And the other one is airway obstruction. If your airway is obstructed, not only having difficulty in moving air, but you're going to have difficulty in clearing some bacteria through that airway. And so both of these will lead to a decreased clearance of bacteria. They'll colonize the airways, and then over time, if they're given the opportunity, they will cause inflammation, infection, and precipitate pneumonia. So this is something to think about. And then again, patients may present with signs of worsening mucopurulent sputum, worsening cough, worsening dyspnea maybe fevers, leukocytosis, other constitutional symptoms that would be concerning that now they have pneumonia secondary to their COPD. All right, respiratory failure. It's the same concept as we talked about up here in emphysema. This could be due 
to again, an acute exacerbation of COPD. And it's the same concept. A patient has some trigger that puts them to get worse. Something that increases airway obstruction. It's a viral UT, uh, upper respiratory tract infection. Or we're gonna put med non-compliant. So they're not taking things that are supposed to prevent inflammation and bronchospasm. Or they're getting infected by something that's gonna cause worsening bronchospasm. And if you cause worsening bronchospasm, you're going to cause increased mucus, maybe more uh, inflammation, bronchospasm, a lot of that process, and this will worsen the airway obstruction. Now, the airway obstruction that these patients develop is not as severe as compared to the patient who has chronic bronchitis. They have lots of mucus, and they have lots of like bronchospasm that's occurring. And here, they'll get some bronchospasm. They'll definitely get a little bit of mucus, but not a lot. So with that being said, they're not gonna have that crazy problem with massive, massive airway obstructions. But nonetheless, it does occur. And so same thing exists. CO2 is really hard to get out. And if I can't get CO2 out, it'll build up within the bloodstream, okay? And that's because again, why? Their airways are super, super hyperinflated because of the airway obstruction that they can't take a deep breath in so they can't generate a good tidal volume. So they hypoventilate. And if that's the case, they can't actually get the CO2 out so it builds up. What's that called again? Hypercapnia. Now here's the thing that you would think. You would think that the, because of that, they would also have difficulty being able to properly ventilate. They don't have that problem as much. So their problem rarely ever exists as hypoxemia. It's primarily hypercapnia. So these patients usually will exhibit a respiratory failure, but it'll usually be a classically a type two respiratory failure. And this one will be classified by a elevated CO2 and a relatively normal oxygen. So their oxygen sometimes will be very normal and their CO2 can be elevated. All right, that is the classic findings that we will see in these patients. But again, because their problem is they can't take these deep breaths in, they'll work really, really hard because they're gonna have to keep trying to generate a good tidal volume. And so because of that, they will show signs of respiratory distress sometimes. And they'll increase their respiratory rate and they'll increase their work of breathing. And this is unfortunately a finding that we can see in these patients with COPD. Now again, you'll pick this up off the blood gas that you'll see findings of respiratory acidosis, findings of respiratory acidosis. You'll see findings of increased respiratory rate, tachypnea, increased work of breathing, sensation of dyspnea. But the big findings that are really different here between chronic bronchitis and emphysema is the oxygen is usually relatively normal. It usually doesn't start dropping until you get to the severe, severe cases of emphysema. Okay. That's that concept. Now we come to the last one that really is a big feature that separates emphysema from COPD and that is the presence of these emphysematous bullae, right? So you can get these bullae that form. So this is a bullae and this one right here is a bullae. Now, what happens is, is this is because of hyperinflation. Whenever the lungs in patients who have COPD get hyperinflated, they get like these like big bulbous portions of lung tissue. These, these are those, those big alveolar sacs. You know how you destroy alveolar septa and elastic tissue? And so you cause these airways to get big and massive. This is classic of it. So they get all these boule. And the problem with these dang things is that they can rupture and decompress right into the pleural cavity. And if they decompress into the pleural cavity, boom, you got air that decides to present itself into the pleural cavity, and there you go, a pneumothorax. But the big thing to understand here is what kind of pneumothorax this patient will have. Is it a primary spontaneous, a secondary spontaneous, or a traumatic? It's a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. So look out for a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. That's one of the potential complications, and this can happen in certain patients who have emphysema. They have an underlying lung injury or disease process that leads to their pneumothorax. That's the concept. So if you have a patient who has an underlying history of COPD, particularly maybe the emphysematous predominant type, and you go and you listen and you hear decrease or absent breath sounds on one side, you see potential signs of tracheal deviation and other things, think about a potential pneumothorax. All right, my friends, that covers the complications of COPD, particularly covering chronic bronchitis, emphysema. Now, how do we go about diagnosing these puppies?
Well, how do we go about diagnosing a patient with COPD? Well, if they come in, they're a little bit older, they're a smoker, they're coming in with dyspnea, productive cough, wheezing, ronch eye on auscultation, decreased breath sounds, increased AP diameter or barrel chest kind of appearance, and they're presenting with respiratory failure or features of right heart failure and pneumonia, things to that effect, I think it's really important to start thinking about COPD. So how do we do this? And any patient who comes in with dyspnea, um, I think it's always important to get a chest x-ray, ECG, and an ABG. The chest x-ray may show some potential signs that are suggestive of pneumonia. Look at this huge AP diameter. So anterior to posterior diameter is massive. They have what's called an increased AP diameter and a barrel chest. They also are super hyperinflated. You can almost see all their ribs. <laughs> That's really a big sign here. Their diaphragm is relatively flat, relatively flat, and there's really increased lucency or darkness in the actual lungs that are a little bit more evident and suggestive of, again, a patient having something of a COPD-like picture. ECG could show right axis deviation. This is just telling me that we have a lot of right heart strain from pulmonary vasoconstriction. And again, right ventricular hypertrophy, again, from a lot of pulmonary vasoconstriction and core pulmonality developing. And ABG is somewhat helpful because again, these patients trap air. They trap air and they trap CO2, which can cause respiratory acidosis to develop. So that's one thing to also look for in a patient who has a COPD uh, kind of disease. This may be chronic for them, or it could be much, much higher if they're having a COPD exacerbation. With that being said, if I find these things and I really want to diagnose COPD, the best test is a PFTs, so pulmonary function tests. I want to look at my FEV1 FEC ratio. Again, suggesting obstructive, I have to have a really low FEV and a low FEC, so the ratio is less than 70%. The next thing is that would be more suggestive of COPD, but how do I rule out asthma? Well, I check the FEV1, and again, this helps me to determine the degree of severity of their COPD, but I use this as a tool after I give them a bronchodilator. If I give them a bronchodilator and I recheck their FEV1 and it's less than 12% increase, that's more suggestive of COPD than it is asthma. Now, if I really want to confirm that this patient has COPD, I can add on some plethysmography or lung volumes. Because total lung capacity, functional residual capacity, and residual volume should all be elevated in patients who have COPD because it suggests a lot of air trapping. And if I looked at their flow volume loops, it would show that it shifted to the left. <clears throat> now, the last thing is I really wanted to go to that extra distance and say, which predominant COPD do I have? If it's a low DLCO, it's because the surface area is reduced. That's emphysema. If the DLCO is normal, though, then that would be more suggestive of chronic bronchitis. Now, real quick talk about emphysema. Emphysema that is usually due to smoking affects more of the upper lobes of the lungs, and we call this centrilobular emphysema. Again, more associated with smoking. But if I have a patient who has panlobular or the lower lobe emphysema and boule, that's a little bit more likely associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now, if that is the case, I'd also want to remember that patients who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency also have underlying liver disease. And so I would also expect their ASTs and ALTs to be elevated. So that's one big thing. And I would also see this in a younger patient, someone who's not of that greater than 60, 65 year age range. So I really think it's important to screen for alpha-1 nitrotrypsin deficiency if they're young, have liver disease, and have panlobular emphysema. And again, going back, if they have a normal DLCO, they have no change in their surface area, no change in the thickness of the respiratory membrane, so that's more suggestive of chronic bronchitis. Okay, that's how we would diagnostically approach COPD. All right, guys, let's move into the treatment of COPD. So whenever we treat a patient with COPD, it's always important to institute things that will reduce mortality. And there's a lot of things that can do that. And I think one of the biggest things is smoking cessation. You're not gonna stop the disease, but you're at least gonna kind of prevent the progressive fibrosis and mucus accumulation and bronchospasm and all that chronic inflammation. So that's a really, really important one to institute. The second one is you should always make sure that these patients are up to date with their flu and pneumococcal vaccination. The reason why, if you go back to that pathophysiology that we talked about, they could have that stable emphysema or stable chronic bronchitis, but if you introduce an infection, like a pneumonia, uh, or you introduce like a viral infection, like influenza or streptococcus pneumonia, then you increase the risk of them developing an acute exacerbation of their COPD, which can cause them to, again, increase the risk of death. On top of that, you can also increase the risk of pneumonia, which also increases the risk of death. So these are important things to institute. The other thing is oxygen therapy. This may reduce the risk of development of right heart failure, or at least the progression of right heart failure. So whenever you give a patient oxygen, you're doing it because, again, oxygen, whenever it's really, really low, it causes pulmonary vasoconstriction, elevated right heart pressures, and then eventually the right heart can fail. 
if they start developing signs of core pulmonality, they need to be on oxygen because that's again, a very, very big risk factor for them is that chronic hypoxemia. When you give them oxygen though, you don't wanna to aim to go too high. You only wanna aim for like 88 to 92%. Because as you go greater than 92%, there's two theories. One is that it may suppress the respiratory drive. You'll lose the, the, the respiratory drive. Because whenever a patient has like uh, PaO2 that's less than 60, it's the primary driving stimulus for the patient to breathe, um, at least a little bit faster and deeper. But if you take that away, you may lose that intense drive. The other thought is that if you increase their oxygen, it may kind of alter the pulmonary vasculature and potentially lead to worsening VQ mismatch. So those are the concepts that you guys have to understand. So I think you always want to ask yourself, if the patient needs oxygen, what are the reasons why? One is the SP2 is chronically less than 88%. They have features of core pulmonality, which is the right heart failure, or they have polycythemia plus an SpO2 of less than 90%. So I'll increase the threshold to start oxygen if they have polycythemia. So these are the things that you want to think about here. After I tell them to stop smoking, make sure that they get vaccinated, consider when they need oxygen, then I'm going to say, do they need bronchodilator therapy or inhaled corticosteroid therapy? So then I ask myself the question, have they had two plus exacerbations in their experience? If the answer is no, okay, well then I'm going to move to the next step. How symptomatic are you? If your MMRC, which is a scale that determines how symptomatic you get, is it, you know, whenever you're really walking upstairs, is it whenever you're kind of like walking flat, is it when you're getting dressed or doing some of your daily activities or if it's at rest, we can get that score off of the MMRC. If it's not greater than or equal to two, then I would say that you're kind of in that low group. So you're in what's called a gold group A. And really this is mild. We can actually kind of do like a SAM or a SABA, bronchodilator therapies. So a SABA is like a butyrol. And you do that when they kind of feel short of breath. Or SAMA, which is like hypertropium, and we can do that also when they're short of breath. So it's one or the other. However, if their symptomatology is a little bit worse and we can actually kind of give them a scale of greater than or equal to two, then we might need to up their actual bronchodilator therapy. So we'll do either, again, a SAMA or a SABA, right? But we'll add on a LABA. So we'll add on something like salmeterol or famoterol. Now, if their two plus exacerbations is yes, then we're in what's called gold group C. So we have to ask two questions. Is their eosinophil count greater than or equal to 300? And have they been hospitalized for their COPD? If the answer to that is no, it's still pretty bad COPD, all right? And so we definitely need to treat them with a SAMA or SABA, again, which either one. But now what we're going to do is we're going to escalate the long-acting bronchodilator. So we're going to continue with a LABA, but we're going to add on it. We're going to add on a LAMA. So a LAMA is going to be something like tiotropium. So they could be on, let's say, for example, if they're in this point, I put them on albuterol plus their uh, tiotropium plus their uh, salmeterol. And they would be on that. They would use the SABA whenever they're dysnic and they would continue daily LAMA LABA therapy. If their eosinophils are greater than or equal to 300 or they have been hospitalized for COPD, this is really bad because this patient is really gonna be in need of inhaled corticosteroids. The more exacerbations they have, the more there is the need for inhaled corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation. And so I would continue the SAM or the SABA, but I would add on an inhaled corticosteroid. So they would be on a SABA, for example, albuterol when they're dysnic, and then daily LAMA, tiotropium, daily salmeterol, and daily inhaled corticosteroid. And this would be an example like budesonide or fluticasone. That is the last thing that we would do for the bronchodilators. But if the patient is still symptomatic, still refractory, you could consider in this last stage here, adding on something like a PDE4 inhibitor. This is more of an experimental drug. And this would be things like rofilumast. If that's failed and you're at the last point here, you can consider things like lung reduction surgery as well. Now, the last component that I want to talk about here in a patient who has COPD is the treatment of an acute exacerbation of their COPD. When a patient has a treat, or an acute exacerbation of their COPD, you really want to try to treat these patients with massive bronchodilation. And so generally, this is going to be the combination of a SAMA and a SABA. So we call this a duoneb. It's ipertropium, which is the SAMA, and albuterol, which is the SABA. The next thing I want to do is really reduce airway inflammation. This probably sounds a lot like asthma, doesn't it? It's pretty similar. The only thing that was different than asthma is that we had IV magnesium. And then again, you had a SAMA SABA for ex acute exacerbation of COPD, SAMA SABA, no IV magnesium, but guess what you're gonna do to reduce airway inflammation? Corticosteroids. So you're gonna give systemic steroids like PO or IV steroids. The next thing is to reduce the work of breathing. What did we do for asthma? It was BiPAP. What am I gonna do here? BiPAP. BiPAP is really interesting because against the same concept as we talked about with asthma is that there's air trapping 
which leads to hyperinflation, hypoventilation, and you build up your CO2 and you develop hypoxemia. What if I throw a BiPAP in here? What does it do? It stents the airways open, allows for me to deflate my lungs, allows me to reduce my work of breathing, and again, clear the CO2, improve my oxygenation, and reduce air trapping. That's a really cool concept. So the last thing that I would actually think is important to, for remembering for the treatment of acute exacerbation of COPD is that these patients, again, they kind of have a lot of bacterial colonization. In patients who have bronchial collapse or lots of mucus, they lead to a lot of bacteria that can't be cleared. And so they can colonize and they can build up to levels where they can actually cause destruction of the tissue, inflammation. And so you really want to reduce bacterial colonization. And oftentimes, one of the things that we throw on for these patients is azithromycin or doxycycline. So again, bronchodilate them, reduce inflammation, BiPAP to reduce the work of breathing, and antibiotics like azithromycin or doxycycline. <clears throat> That's how we would treat an acute exacerbation of COPD. All right, my friends, that's COPD. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.